Well, good afternoon, everyone, to our audience, both uh, here in the Fender School at the ANU and to those of you online. My name's uh, Peter Burnett. I'm from the ANU College of Law. And it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Ian Fry, Dr. Ian Fry, who's going to talk to us about navigating the politics of the Commonwealth Endangered Species Legislation. Um, Ian's had uh, an eclectic career. He started life as, a, or his working life, as a ranger with the New South Wales Parks and Conservation Service. He's worked as an environmental consultant for an ABC television show, and he's also worked for a number of non-government organisations before he took up life as an academic. Ian's also a, um, a distinguished um, person in international uh, law. Uh, he's been, until recently, the ambassador for climate change and environment for the, the government of Tuvalu, um, which I think included Ian attending the Paris conference in 2015. So uh, um, that's a very significant world event. Uh, he's uh, the Pacific uh, representative to the United Nations for the International Council for Environmental Law. So that's a UN body. Uh, and he's also a member of the uh, IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. So as I say, distinguished uh, positions. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, hand over to Ian and ask him to uh, speak to the, the politics of Commonwealth Endangered Species legislation. Over to you, Ian. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. It's uh, certainly a, a pleasure and honor. And, uh, very grateful for you to introduce me. Uh, you're certainly the guru of Commonwealth uh, environmental legislation, so it was, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, so I'm, first, I should uh, pay my respects to the traditional owners and elders of the land where we're meeting today, uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And, you know, not only paying my surreal respects, but also hope that we can find more legal approaches to recognising their ownership of the land. So I'm going to talk to you about the uh, navigating the politics of Commonwealth and endangered species legislation. And as, as the, uh, as this, uh, um, and is implied we have to go back into the dark ages, uh, back to the mid 1980s. And uh, I was working for a small NGO at the time, uh, which was called EcoFund Australia, which uh, proposed uh, this legislation. We got Dr. Keith Souter to draft some endangered species legislation um, as, a, as a way of trying to, to get this off the ground. And it really was the genius of uh, Michael Kennedy who came up with this whole, whole process. Michael was the director of the EcoFund Australia, which evolved out of another organisation called Fund for Animals. Uh, and he, he was the real driving force behind this. He la later uh, formed the Humane Society International and continued sort of campaigning on endangered species issues for a number of years. So this, uh, basically, this booklet uh, actually had, you know, reasons why we wanted to have endangered species legislation. We did an analysis of uh, key habitats around Australia where there were high concentrations of endangered species. Um, but uh, as I said, uh, it also had a draft piece of legislation. So my, my job was to, uh, to go into, into Parliament and, and um, try and convince Parliament uh, that this endangered species legislation was needed. So I, I uh, fronted up at Old Parliament House uh, to meet uh, Barry Cohen, who was the Minister for uh, uh, Home Affairs and the Environment back in, uh, in, the, in the mid 1980s to, to really uh, convince him that this was needed. This is the first time I'd really had any experience in sort of lobbying politicians, and it was a real eye-opener for me. There are a number of aspects of being in, uh, inside B uh, Barry Cohen's office, and I I'll, I'll draw attention to a few of these. Um, there were certainly observations that I made within, the, in the, uh, within his office. I'll just pick two of these, uh, considering the time. So I, I was introduced to the minister, and he pulled out his wallet and gave me a card. And he looked me up and down and says, you greenies have got terrible suits. Where did you get that from? 
and being a, you know, a, a greenie of uh, not much uh, income, I bought my suit at St. Vincent de Paul and it was certainly years out of date, very shiny. And he knew that straight away because the card he'd given me was a card for a suit shop in St. Ives in the northern suburbs of Sydney, which he owned. And that was a, a thing that sort of rung home to me is that, you know, politicians are not only just politicians, they're business people as well, and they have a background. So that was, uh, that was quite interesting. I, I didn't go to his shop in the end, but the other issue, we got invited into his office and he pulled out what I, I could best describe as what you see as a picture book. He opened this book and said, this is our manifesto for the environment. And on one page was a picture, it might have been showing the Murray-Darling Basin, and on the other page was one paragraph saying, we're going to clean up the Murray. And then he'd turn it over like, a, like in a kindergarten and, so, and show something else. And, and this was the standard of uh, you know, knowledge and engagement that the environment minister had, was basically a picture book. So this, this really brought me home the message that you know, you've got to you keep the messages as simple as possible to... Uh, to present to ministers. Oh, the, the, uh, I'll tell you number five, because the, the, the Attorney General walked into the room while we were having, uh, we were having this picture book demonstration, and he, uh, the Minister Cohen and, and the Attorney General started talking about magpies. Huh? Um, but it wasn't the magpies that fly around the trees, it was the Collingwood Football Club uh, that they were talking about and who was going to win on the weekend. So this is again the sort of the thing you have to deal with is you realise that ministers are, are human beings as well. As, and so it's a, again something you've got to learn about. While, while we were campaigning with Barry Cohen uh, to get this endangered species legislation, um, the, the, the sort of umbrella or co-organisation of EcoFund Australia was Fund for Animals, and it was run by Richard Jones, who was an interesting character. He and Michael Kennedy basically set up um, Fund for Animals. He believed that Barry Cohen was on the take on the kangaroo industry, and he hired a private detective to, to find out dirt on Barry Cohen. Um, of course, uh, in, in the proceeds of uh, hiring this uh, private detective, Barry Cohen found out about it. Um, and basically, you know, from that day onwards, he just shut the door to us entirely. So we, we uh, you know, lost our chances of getting dangerous species legislation because of this belief that Barry Cohen had, uh, was on the take in the kangaroo industry. Having worked with National Parks and Wildlife Service, I certainly knew that it was highly unlikely that a federal environment minister would be on the take because the kangaroo industry is such an amateur uh, business that, that uh, I don't think they'd be organised well enough to, to provide incentive to the minister. Um, while we were working on this legislation, just as a, I'm sort of going off into tangents of, of political intrigue, I could guess you could say, is that we, Back in the dark ages, we didn't have computers to work from, so a lot of our documents we were preparing had to be typed by somebody. And so we employed uh, a law student um, who lived uh, in a house, who shared a house with a, a woman who was a, a, an opera singer. And so I used to go to this house and present papers and pick them up to be uh, typed. Um, but it, as it happened, uh, a member of parliament, Tom Uren, a, a sort of well-known lefty of the, of the, the Labor Party, was having a, a relationship with one of the occupants of the house. So whenever I fronted up at his house to pick up documents, I had to disappear if he was there. So these, these are the sort of uh, challenges you have to, have to confront uh, in, in this whole game. So the next, next step, uh, you know, Barry Cohen uh, uh, left his uh, portfolio of, of Minister for Environment. And so the next Environment Minister that came along was Graham Richardson. And uh, he, he was well known as, uh, uh, you know, the, the numbers man for the Labor Party. He was certainly the Secretary of the La Australian Labor Party. Uh, and he was, in 1987, was appointed to the, as Minister for Environment and Arts. Now, Graham Richardson has a very sort of colourful history, um, and uh, he wrote a book about part of that, uh, that history, which was called Whatever It Takes. And uh, there were certainly uh, 
allegations made about Graham Richardson um, organising a bashing of a left-wing member of the Labor Party, a Peter Baldwin. Um, and this is a sort of before and after picture of Peter Baldwin. By, uh, he was bashed by some well-known uh, colourful identities in, in Sydney underworld. And there were allegations that uh, Graham Richardson um, had uh, organised this. In fact, uh, Kate McClymont, uh, a journo for the, the Herald, sort of interviewed uh, one of these uh, colourful identities, um, Tom Dominic, Dom, no, Joe Meisner it was, and uh, said that, uh, that Graham Richardson had put them up to this, this sort of bashing. Of course, this is just allegations, um, and this were, these were vehemently um, denied by Richardson. In fact, he, he, uh, he sued uh, Fairfax for defamation and won that case. But it, but it sort of gives you a sort of sense of the, the sort of character that, that he was. Now, Graham Richardson was, Richardson was primarily interested in what he called the big ticket items. So he got involved with the Tasmanian Dams case, uh, 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 Kakadu and the wet, uh, wet tropics area, because he knew that uh, by getting involved in those issues, um, he he would uh, you know win over the green vote. But he certainly wasn't interested in sort of institutional issues like legislation. So we had very little uh, opportunity to get support from him for endangered species legislation, uh, which was quite disappointing. Certainly, he was. He was quite significant in the, in the Tasmanian case, et cetera, but he certainly wasn't very um, interested in sort of uh, administrative or, or institutional change. So we then turn to uh, the Democrats and John Coulter uh, was very keen on, on, on the whole issue of endangered species. Uh, he was certainly uh, a fer fervent supporter of doing more work on endangered species and he introduced uh, a, a private member's bill, which was the bill that we provided him um, on endangered species uh, in, into the Senate. And he's also known, if you can see in the bottom right hand of this picture of, uh, by promoting endangered species, the, the uh, chocolate bilby. So he wanted uh, chocolate uh, rabbits for Easter be become uh, chocolate bilbies to sort of draw more attention to, uh, to uh, endangered species. Um, so he, he introduced this legislation in the Senate uh, and it, it was debated just near Christmas time. And so I was hanging around Parliament. By this time I'd moved on from uh, EcoFund Australia and started working for Greenpeace Australia. Um, and uh, so I, I uh, went to the Democrats' Christmas party in Parliament House that was being held at the same time that this legislation was debate, being debated in the Senate. And there were various members of Parliament, not only Democrats attending this Christmas party, one of these being the Honourable Peter Walsh, who used to be the, uh, the finance minister for the Labor Party, um, a member of the sort of right of the, of the Labor Party, and I, I uh, introduced myself to Peter Walsh at this Christmas party. He was certainly well under the weather at the time. And he just swore black and blue at me and said, you effing bastards, you're all a pack of effing liars. You know, you don't know what you're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the division bells rang and he got up and walked out into the, into the chamber of the Senate and voted down the, uh, the Democrats' legislation. After the division that had ended, he came back into the Democrats' room and started drinking their, their, their alcohol again. So this is, again, is the sort of nature of the politics you have to deal with. There's some um, pretty interesting characters. He did come back to me and apologise. He said, oh, I'm effing sorry I was so rude to you, but I don't feel any different the way I feel about you. Uh, so I, I felt a little bit reconciled by that fact. So um, the Democrats... Uh, a bill was uh, voted down by both the Labor Party and, and the, uh, the Liberal Party, the coalition. And of course, as we know, the Democrats' uh, life didn't survive uh, too long uh, after that. Uh, Cheryl Curnow became leader of the Democrats and had, uh, uh, I think she's actually admitted to having an affair with Gareth Evans, who was then the, the, uh, uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister.
Uh, and the, uh, Gareth convinced her to leave the Democrats and be, uh, join the Labor Party. So these are all the sort of challenges that uh, having to deal with politicians. And the Democrats, you know, key theme was keeping the bastards honest. But uh, certainly they uh, might not have lived up to that, uh, to that theme uh, towards the end. So we, we lost that, uh, you know, that battle of getting a bill up and running through, through using the, the Democrats. So we then you know, moved to lobbying the next environment minister, which was Ros Kelly. She was the member for Canberra here in Canberra. And, and she was quite interested in taking up this, uh, uh, up this legislation. She had some very good uh, people on staff with, within her own staff, uh, Dr. Judy Lambert, uh, Dr. Tony Fleming, who later became head of the Australian National Parks and Wildlife Service. So they, they, were, they were good people involved with that. I, I have to give you a little anecdote about uh, the process of lobbying, um, even within, uh, you know, in Parliament. And this, this was the wooden bowl incident. I walked in to see uh, the staffers of uh, Ros Kelly Stafford to see how the legislation was progressing. And the person I was speaking to, speaking to said, I, I think it would be advisable if you put this wooden bowl on your head, which he had on his table. So uh, uh, I dutifully put this wooden bowl on, on my head. And just after I did that, this tennis ball hit the wall right above my head uh, and bounced off the wall and hit the, hit the desk of this uh, staffer and sent papers flying everywhere. Um, a sort of bizarre incident in the, in the lobbying world. The reason behind this is that the staffers worked very long hours in Parliament, and this was during sitting time, and you know they, they necessarily you know get bored at times, so they were having an inter-office war with a tennis ball, so uh, so I so that I didn't become collateral damage in this uh, in this inter-office war, I, I was given uh, appropriate. <laughs> Um, a helmet to wear to, to avoid getting uh, smashed. Uh, and so Ros Kelly did take up this, this, uh, this legislation and ran with it, and it was, it was not an easy battle for her. Uh, certainly ca uh, members, certain members of Cabinet were uh, strongly opposed to the legislation. And she also was confronted with the, what was called the whiteboard affair. And as we've heard in more recent times, uh, you know, the sports rorts uh, affair, well, she had her own sort of sports rorts affair where she had a whiteboard with, uh, you know, electorates named and sporting grants because she was also Minister for Sports. So, um, you know, politics have a way of sort of going in a cycle around that. But she certainly was a, a strong fighter for this and I don't think she's credited as much uh, as being quite a strong environment minister as some people would, would, would think, you know, that most people sort of think Richardson was the man, but she was certainly involved more strongly in institutional change. And she brought in the whole process of ecologically sustainable development. Um, you know, and this was around the time of the Rio Earth Conference and that, and she certainly, uh, you know, the, the, uh, picked up on that work. Nevertheless, uh, Laurie Breton, who was, uh, I think, the resources minister at the time, who came through the New South Wales uh, Parliament and then came to federal parliament at, at the encouragement of, uh, of the Prime Minister, Paul Keating, um, uh, introduced this clause into the legislation, which effectively um, gives a veto of other ministers sort of saying, it basically says a minister so notified or another Commonwealth agency has the power to prohibit, restrict or impose requirements on the activity or proposed activity. And the activity being, uh, you know, taking a measure to protect the species. So this, you know, this was the only way it got through cabinet was to have this sort of veto clause where basically ministers could, could oppose an action to protect the species if they so wanted to. So that, that, that was uh, the deal that had to be struck within cabinet to allow this legislation to go through. So it did, it did come about um, in 1992, 
the Endangered Species Protection Act uh, came into being. And so this basically set up a process where you could nominate endangering processes, you could nominate species, uh, there was a sort of review process, but it primarily only dealt with Commonwealth actions um, and, and on Commonwealth land. So it, it, it was restricted in that regard that there were sort of limitations to uh, the applicability <laughs> the use of the legislation. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it stood alone as a piece of legislation uh, until um, uh, Philip Toyne, uh, who, who used to be the uh, director of the Australian Conservation Foundation, uh, who took up the position of deputy secretary in the Commonwealth Department, started working on uh, amalgamating uh, all the sort of environment legislation into one piece of legislation, which eventually became the en Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act um, and in 1999. So the endangered species legislation um, got, got um, brought into that. So the, the endangered species legislation repealed the uh, the uh, endangered uh, the environment protection biodiversity conservation act um, basically repealed the standalone legislation and incorporated that into a, a broader piece of legislation um, and so it still had the process of listing threatened species and communities and and dealing with actions on that so we now now got this endangered species legislation incorporated within a, a broader piece of legislation. And bringing into a broader piece of legislation did give it a sort of broader scope because, because of the, 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 the sort of constitutional powers that could be brought upon by, by the Commonwealth. Um, this piece of legislation has been uh, reviewed in uh, uh, twice. Uh, it's currently finishing off its second review. There was another review um, uh, not uh, 10 years ago, was it? Yes. Uh, that what was called the Hawk Review, and it's now uh, a new review was initiated uh, last year under the under the guidance of Professor Samuel uh, Graham Samuel. So this was uh, a review process uh, to deal with that. So the, the, the findings of this review are due out uh, within the next month or so. Um, and, uh, you know, we're waiting eagerly for that, noting, however, that we have a Conservative government uh, on board. And in fact, uh, the government has introduced a piece of legislation called the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendments in brackets, and this is the crucial bit, streamlining environmental approvals. So this is uh, this bill that's before Parliament as we stand here is basically to accelerate the approval process of environmental approvals, to fast track it and, and ostensibly give a lot of the control back to the states. Now procedurally, uh, the, the existing uh, legislation could do this, but this accelerates that process to, to, uh, to facilitate uh, handing uh, authority back to the states. And th this can be shown in, in part of the legis uh, legislation. Uh, assessment by state or territories may be used if declaration made under bilateral agreements. So the legislation already has these bilateral agreements, but uh, it just uh, facilitates that uh, in a more accelerated way. Um, and there have been a number of commentaries about this, uh, this amendment uh, to the legislation. Certainly GetUp have talked about this is returning back to the, uh, the government resurrects Abbott's environmental laws, divesting the Commonwealth of an overall responsibility for environment and giving that back to the states. So there's been certainly a lot of criticism around that. And certainly the environment minister um, uh, you know, has been accused of gagging debate in the lower house. So when this, this bill was introduced into parliament, uh, they certainly cut short the time uh, for debate on this legislation. So it's now gone through uh, the lower house and has been presented to the, um, to the Senate for consideration.
Um, surprisingly enough, the New South Wales Environment Minister, uh, uh, Matt Keen, has called on the federal government not to move too quickly with this legislation. Uh, and and, uh, and that, that's quite admirable, I guess, but particularly from a, a coalition a government at the state level to deal with that. Um, and so it's now before the Senate, and we've heard that some of the crossbench in the Senate have said that they uh, are, are likely to block this legislation. So sort of Jackie Lambie and others of uh, um, Griff, uh, Sterling Griff and Rex Patrick have indicated that they're going to block the passage of this legislation. So this is a, a challenging time that we have before us now. Uh, it, it, you know, we're at an unprecedented time of species loss uh, within Australia. Uh, and so, you know, any sort of devolution of authority or weakening of environment legislation is certainly a concern. And we've, we've sort of seen the battles even within New South Wales recently uh, over the, 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 the koala issue uh, in New South Wales. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of faith in being able to uh, uh, divest responsibilities from the Commonwealth to the states if we're gonna have that sort of debate around koalas um, in this. I, I have to go back again, back to the, to the uh, old age and, and show that this, this issue of the koala issue uh, is not new. In fact, uh, back in 1986, uh, going back to the EcoFund Australia days, we, we were fighting against a uh, st state environmental planning policy to facilitate the development of retirement homes. So this was sort of overriding legislation that could override other planning rules to allow uh, retirement homes to be built. And one of these was in critical uh, koala habitat on the northern peninsula of Sydney uh, around Avalon. And uh, residents groups and and we were involved in in trying to stop this development of this uh, retirement village, but we were told by uh, somebody privately within the government that uh, your chances of stopping this development were highly unlikely, um, because the major developer of this uh, of this retirement home was a, a company that was a major donor to the Labor Party. Uh, and so the, these are the challenges we, we have to deal with in, in trying to get this. And so uh, as we've seen, you know, the, this is part of the problem of this slow incremental decline in habitat, uh, 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 as we are now seeing just with koalas, you know, uh, uh, an iconic species as koalas uh, slowly losing their habitats and of course exacerbated by climate change um, uh, you know, and fires, etc. But we see that across the board in the whole of Australia is this, this uh, uh, decline of species through habitat change. Uh, and clearly, um, you know, some of the issues we're, we're seeing is land clearing uh, and, and certainly this state environmental policy that's being proposed on koalas won't deal with that, uh, that, that sort of major land clearing on private land. So the, these are the real challenges we're confronted with. Uh, even though we have uh, endangered species legislation before us, um, the, the changes that are occurring before us uh, are not doing enough to, to uh, the legislation is just not doing enough. We're not taking it seriously enough. We're not thinking about the, the endangering processes or the threatening processes to deal with it. So we certainly need, uh, you know, revamping of legislation. And I would certainly argue that we clearly need uh, uh, an independent commission against corruption at the Commonwealth level as well, uh, to, to deal with uh, conflicts of interest with politicians, as we've seen recently with certain members of the National Party having interests on land where there was protection for, for, for species. So this is the challenge that we have before us and we don't have a lot of time. In fact, this is the sitting time for, for the Senate to review this, uh, this uh, uh, bill 
to fast track uh, approval process. And so next week, Senator, the Senate will be sitting uh, to look at the review of this legislation. So that, that's the real challenge we had before us. Uh, can we convince the Senate to, to block this legislation? And how do we get this sort of, you know, a better review of environment legislation to properly, you know, facilitate this decline in habitats primarily? And of course, you know, the bigger picture of how do we, how do we protect species from, from climate change, which is, a, which is a major concern. So that's just a sort of uh, introduction into the sort of the challenges of getting through legislation you know, through a parliamentary process with all, all the, type, you know, the, the, the goings on that occur within po uh, politics that uh, you have to deal with. It's, it's not an easy path and uh, we certainly have to, to remain vigilant in trying to ensure that our politicians are accountable. So uh, I'd certainly like to uh, thank you for uh, listening to this presentation and certainly happy to take any questions. Thank you. Have we got any questions for Ian? There's one here in the room. And if, you're, if you want to ask a question online, I don't know how to work that. I don't know if we've got uh, the chat I think facility. we've got somebody. Uh, in another room being able to we'll, do that. We'll for see us. how we go. We'll start with the one in the room. Um, okay. Um, I assume that some of the backstory around politicians and what therefore happened um, would still foreshadow some potential of what's going on with politics right now. I mean, the thing with those of us who are up there and the need for us to move the community forward in terms of the change that you call for us. Yes, well, this is a challenge. I mean, we, we've got uh, w what we're confronted with is, and, and Peter might be better able to answer this than ourselves because he made a major uh, contribution to the, this current review of the environment legislation. And yet the Commonwealth Government has introduced legislation ahead of even the findings of this review. So that, that's, that's quite alarming that the government has introduced legislation before we even hear the outcomes of the Samuel review. So that, that's, that's not very encouraging, I'd say. You know, under this current government, uh, it's certainly not very encouraging that, that they're actually, uh, you know, preempting a conclusion of a review. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a, a real concern. So things aren't going well for us at the moment, particularly with species protection. We just have a look in the chat box to see if there's any questions. Oh, okay, sure. Um, Mel, did you want to come in? Oh, uh, yeah, repeat the question. So, yeah. I guess it was about the status of where we're at now compared to what it was back in the dark ages. Yeah. And, and it's certainly, you know, things haven't improved. Okay. That's fine. Yes. So we've got some questions. Yeah. Right. Um, So uh, one of the questions is similar to what we just heard there. So, um, where are there opportunities for better, uh, for making better and, and making reforms? And, and this, this is the challenge we have before us with the government we have, who's introduced preemptory legislation before, before we've even heard the Samuels review. And, that, and, and if you look at some of the submissions that went into the Samuel review, like Peter's here, uh, the Environmental Defenders Office and other organizations, uh, you know, that there was clearly a view to, to try and strengthen the role of the Commonwealth. 
because, because we, we really have a disparate system amongst our states as far as species protection is concerned. And there really needs to be some centralised a body to deal with that in collaboration with the states. Obviously, the states have major responsibility for the management of the land, but we certainly need uh, uh, stronger national standards to deal with that legislation. So that, that was certainly uh, one of the questions, I think. Uh, and the other issue was we, you know, people concerned about not hearing the, the, uh, the question from the floor. So if there, any other questions that people would like? Would you like to come in, uh, uh, Peter? And I, I might just make a comment, going, going back to your, your question here, it's sort of on the, the circularity of things or the fact that we never seem to get very far. So firstly, on the politics, uh, Ian talked about, you know, the, the, the politicians in the, particularly in the Ros Kelly era with the division in cabinet and this, um, so you get, on the one hand, you get your, your endangered species legislation, on the other hand, there's this clause written in the, basically an escape clause, allowing the, the relevant minister, say the industry minister, whatever the proposal it is, to, to override it and, and, and block it. And that's the only way they can get it through. So, so the Labor Party there was divided. Well, the very same thing is in this morning's paper. So you had a major decision yesterday in New South Wales to approve um, a coal seam gas development at Narrabri. Now that's not a final approval because it's got to get a federal approval as well, although I think that's pretty certain. But then in this morning's um, media, you have an article about split within Labor. Um, Joel Fitzgibbon, the agriculture spokesperson's come out and said, you know, this is terrific. Um, so pleased about the, um, the Narrabri gas approval, whereas Mark Butler, the climate minister, has talked about the phasing out of gas. And, and the, the tenor of the article was, we've got these divisions in the Labor Party and we've got to find a way to resolve them or, or they're not going to win the next election. Well, it's the same basic thing that was going on 30 years ago. Nothing's really changed. And the same with um, the, the policy, the actual content of these kinds of laws. Um, the general approach that, uh, although Graham Samuel's final review is not out yet, he put out an interim report in July and sort of signalled where he was going. And in the, in the broad, he's saying we need environmental standards. You know, it's all too, uh, uh, it's lacking in prescription and what the, what the outcome's going to be. You know, the, under the current system, the minister has regard to this, that and the other to threaten species or sustainable development, whatever, and then you just make, make a decision. It can be anything. So the answer seems to be environmental standards. Uh, and uh, Samuel has also been strong on regional planning, which would involve going in ahead and working out what have we got here, you know, where's the important habitat, etc. And then you can have hopefully avoid uh, affecting it with development decisions. Well, yesterday I had reason to look up the New South Wales Environmental Planning and Assessment Act, which is 1979. So this is a 40-year-old uh, 40, 40 law, 41-year-old law. And I was looking at it in its original form. It's been much amended since then. It's still around, but it's been heavily amended. But if you go back to the original form, what does it say? It says state environmental policies, which is very similar to standards. And it says uh, environmental plans. So basically it's the same, the, the policy model in, the, in that law, which was, I think, Australia's first um, uh, sophisticated um, law dealing with environmental decision making. It's much the same model as Graham Samuel is floating now. So have we actually made progress? So my, my question for you, Ian, you've talked about the, the history of this. Do you sense that we've actually made any progress in terms of on-ground outcomes? Well, <laughs> I, I think the general trend is no, we, we haven't. I mean, uh, we, we're certainly not doing enough to protect species uh, uh, at the moment. You know, perhaps we've slowed the decline in the loss of species, but there are certainly major, you know, impacts uh, from the mining industry, from land clearing, from farmers, uh, 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 water mismanagement that are, are a major threatening process to species. And so we're not dealing with those. These sort of economic interests override our concerns about uh, endangered species uh, in those areas. And, and it really needs, you know, a government 
you know, a, a, a government with a bit of foresight to, to, to bring that around. It wouldn't take a lot to, to bring those sort of national standards into play if there was a government that was interested in doing that. And, uh, and perhaps, you know, we're, we're as default as much as anybody else, that we're not, you know, bringing this to the attention of the politicians and saying, you know, we, we really shouldn't be losing species uh, and, and, you know, saying that uh, uh, we, we should be bringing this higher up in the sort of, you know, the political spectrum of, of uh, in, in front of politicians at the moment. Yes, Mel. So the question was: Is uh, how does how does this apply? Uh, how does Australia seen in the context of the the UN Convention on Biodiversity, and how do other countries see Australia's role in this regard? Certainly, you know the the the, the Convention on Biodiversity has broad obligations uh, about protecting species, and I I think you know the current uh, rate of endangerment is is certainly a worry, and you know Australia has been looked at by other countries, but, uh, you know, that they're not performing well in this regard. Uh, but but there, are, there are no real, uh, you know, teeth to the Convention on Biodiversity to, to place sanctions on Australia for, for not doing anything properly. Perhaps uh, they could use the uh, dispute resolution mechanism, uh, you know, to say, why, why are you losing these species? And, uh, you know, can there be something better done? But it's certainly, uh, you know, they're not living, Australia at the moment is not living up to the expectations of the Convention on Biodiversity. Yeah, yeah um, I was just going to ask about sustainability and what the different institutions or agencies are in Australia specifically that most of the checks and balances for against the government for their implementation of environmental policy. So the question was about what are, what are the checks and balances that can be applied to the government uh, for for applying environmental laws? Well, you know, this this is uh, there are challenges. Uh, that there are various processes that can be initiated, like merits review and and some judicial reviews that can be uh, implemented by by citizens organisations around individual decisions. So, uh, like we see with this uh, narrow, narrow by uh, gas uh, proposal, is likely to be, uh, you know, some sort of review be, would be applied if that if that uh, gas proposal goes ahead. So, and, and this is part of the problem: is that we 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 these are just little piecemeal attempts at trying to stop certain developments, whereas there isn't a sort of holistic. A review process for for considering how this sort of incremental change is is uh, is a, a problem. So you know we we have legislative measures to deal with things on an individual basis, but we don't have a sort of review mechanism at a broader scale to to uh, to see how it's going. Other than what we're seeing with this sort of uh, the Samuel review inquiry on the legislation. Um, other than that, there's there's not much on offer at the moment. Uh, Ian, there's another question in the uh, chat box there, second from the bottom. Um, so uh, this one is about, uh, I'm interested in potential role of regional national resource management plans and entities, mostly bilateral agreements, uh, to help define standards, refine and uphold environmental laws. So this, this was sort of picking up your point and the Samuels review that perhaps we need to be taking more of a sort of regional approach to this. Certainly species don't recognize uh, state boundaries and we, we have to, to you know, look at the sort of major ecosystems uh, across on a regional level and, and, and develop some uh, more effective regional plans. This is, uh, you know, regional natural resource management planning has always been a challenge, as we've seen with the Murray 
Darling uh, Basin Authority in being able to coordinate uh, four states plus the Commonwealth Government to, to, uh, to effectively regulate and manage uh, you know, uh, Australia's most important water system. So regional planning is a good idea, but to get collaboration between the states when there are competing economic interests uh, certainly represents a challenge. So Ian, there's a question above that that was basically the experts are ignored, um, the politicians don't listen, do we need to take a new tack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, there's been, I mean, there's been some interesting cases that are, that are reviewed. Uh, logging in Victoria and effect on leadbeater's possums and things like that, and decisions being made that, that you know, continue a, a process of, of a decline of those species through, through logging practices. I mean, what, uh, we have to rely on, on at least laws to, to give us protection for species. And, and, and I guess we've just got to try and, you know, push harder uh, to, to bring those, you know, those laws up to a better standard. Of course, there are a lot of citizens' actions to deal with protecting species. You know, there are lots of organisations uh, around Australia who are doing a lot of very useful work in trying to protect species. But it's very hard to have a sort of holistic national approach to this um, without it, you know, the government being on board because they're the primary decision makers, particularly about, you know, development approvals and things like that. So we, we really need, you know, a national government to come on board to this process. And there's a question here in the Q&A box, just, or two questions, just need to click on this to see what's there, there you go. Okay, um, so the question is, does the Samuel Review have a recommendation for an independent body to set up protected threatened species, communities and climate change issues? At the moment, the public fund the development proposals, but have to fund legal action against, to appeal against unsatisfactory outcomes. So, I, I, you know, as Peter was saying, that there is a proposal, you know, under this to set some sort of national standards to have a, a, a national independent authority, perhaps, that's one step distant from the government, uh, like the Environment Protection Authority in the United States, to have a sort of a national authority that sets some standards. And hopefully that, that would apply to, uh, to a setting standards for the protection of species. Um, so that, that's an opportunity there. Um, we've got a question from a ranger from the AC2, want to connect my job to the EPBC for better understanding and managing nature reserves. Um, and and what, what, what's a good way of doing that, I guess, and what documents are found within that regard? Well, uh, you know, as far as uh, work of a ranger, um, uh, there's been a seminal piece of work produced uh, uh, by Graham Warboys, who tragically died this week, uh, uh, providing a manual for, for uh, uh, National Parks and Wildlife on, on a whole host of issues, which is uh, produced by IUCN. And I, I want to pay my respects to uh, Graham's family um, for his uh, tragic passing away. Uh, clearly, clearly there are connections between, you know, the, the ACT government and perhaps the ACT government is sort of well ahead of a lot of other, other governments as far as species protection is concerned. The trouble is, is that species don't recognise the ACT border and when they wander across into New South Wales then they're, they're, they're not so well protected. So uh, I, maybe uh, this um, question could I, I could probably better write write uh, an answer to this rather than give uh, you know to give references uh, to this one. So are there any other questions? Um, yes, from the floor. From Be more safe 
we work with artists that are going to accommodate and improve their events, like any case you support. I mean, if we do kind of count closing things, uh, one was creating a system for Bob Meyer where the agency, public agencies spend more time defending themselves in court than they did actually doing any land management. But it also, there was an accountability mechanism there that feels like we're lacking here to actually require them to change their behavior when there was really egregious um, infringements on, on index basics. Do we need to think about something like that? So the question was, uh, you know, we know that the United States is more litigious in, in its uh, bringing uh, forward cases to question the government's decision making and, and uh, should we be moving down that direction and are, are there means to do that? So certainly, uh, you know, some of the state legislation is better in, in uh, sort of judicial review processes. Uh, New South Wales uh, uh, Environment Protection Act and the Victorian Act uh, are better in allowing public review processes to take place. So I think, you know, the Commonwealth needs to, to uh, take on board some of those sort of review, better review mechanisms uh, that, that are in state legislation. But, um, and, and I think we're starting to see uh, more, more legal action, particularly around climate change related issues, you, you know, challenging your coal mines and things like that. But a lot of that work is being done by organisations like the Environmental Defenders of Organisations, whose resources are very stretched. You know, they're, they're losing uh, financial support from government, uh, and therefore they're, they're challenged themselves to be able to, you know, bring cases before, before courts to, to deal with those issues. And the, the, the issue again is, you know, these are one-off bits of developments, you know, and, and we, it's not looking at a sort of, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem-wide means of dealing with these sort of incremental changes that are occurring, which is is the real challenge. Um, but I, I I see that there there are more cases coming before us. You know, we um, we are seeing more of this. You know, we are slowly picking up the sort of U.S. system. But I I don't think the opportunities are there at the Commonwealth level as much as we, it could be. So the question is, is uh, if these streamlined approval process go through, what, what are the major implications of that? I mean, uh, there are some of the states that have quite good uh, legislation for protecting species. So, so some of it, uh, you know, would be okay, but, but there are certainly other states, uh, you know, the, the Mining Republic of Western Australia, whose endangered species legislation is not so great, uh, you know, will we'll, you know, certainly be a backward step, I think. And, and that, that's the challenge is uh, we don't have national standards. And if we allow it to be thrown to the states again, then, then uh, you know, we're, we're, we're giving away that sort of national responsibility to deal with species. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it will, will be a backward step, you know, it'll certainly, uh, and, you know, as we saw with the battle in New South Wales, even to protect, you know, high profile species like koalas, we, we don't have sympathetic governments at the moment. I think we've almost Finished. run out of time. All right. Well, we've, we've run out of time. We've run out of questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you for attending also online. And uh, please join with me in thanking Anne for a great presentation. <laughs>